is a talk that's all about demystifying something that we often shroud in legend, being a bug bounty hunter. All we hear about is the big payouts or the big conflicts within the field. Success, we say, is down to luck or a stroke of inspiration, but is it really? Robert Vulpe is a bug bounty hunter who's been listed on Forbes 30 Under 30, as well as in the Hall of Fame of several big applications companies. And he's here to tell us all about what it takes to be a successful bug bounty hunter. Robert, you have the stage. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Alexandra, for the introduction. Really nice of you to say all those things. Um, yeah, so um, happy to be here. I'm Robert Vulpe. I do practically a lot of bug bounty hunting. Um, um, so a bit of history. Right now I'm a full-time bug bounty hunter. I've been um, I've been like this for I think four months already. But I've been doing this on the side for the last uh, three years or something. And I will talk all about the financial aspects at uh, almost at the end of this. Uh, I, I've reported over 300 vulnerabilities on different bug bounty programs to different companies. I found bugs in Amazon, in PayPal, in Goldman Sachs, Epic Games, Bedfair, and a lot of companies I can't talk, I can't really talk about. Um, I've been awarded Forbes 30 under 30 for cybersecurity, and uh, this is uh, this is a story that's really close to my heart. That, but um, somewhere at 10 years old, I think I found my first. Uh, it wasn't really the first vulnerability that I found. It was, but it was a really interesting one because I was playing a lot of World of Warcraft on private servers, and in in one of the in the server that I was playing, like. I was already playing for three or four months. I was really invested in that game and that server. And uh, I, I thought maybe, maybe I'm checking out the part where I can donate stuff, where, where I, well, I can uh, give money to this private server and they'll get me a donation. Um, it was some donation gear. It was really, well, it was a lot better than what you get in the game. And uh, playing around with that, I found an SQL injection and I was able to, practically give myself a uh, donation gear and from that age i didn't i didn't actually do that i um i told admin i uh asked i sent him an email uh, with well i found this this is really bad you should fix it and he uh, kind of contracted me for fixing it and making it making it better it was really cool um so let's begin with bug bounties well, bug bounty hunting is not an illegal activity. It's <laughs> an activity where companies kind of allow you to hack in their in their scope. And I'll talk a bit about that because their policy is really important. And they pay a lot of money for this. It depends on the company, but for example, the company that the companies that I listed here really care about their security, so they will be they will be paying you if you find something important. Um, so let's go to, well, this bug bounty hunting, it's, um, it's kind of a passion for me because um, I'm, really, I'm really passionate about this security stuff. I'm really passionate about finding interesting, big vulnerabilities. And um, before, because before going into security, I was, uh, uh, I was, doing programming i was a coder for seven years i think and um the thing is it's it was it really fascinated me how do i make or build this stuff and now i'm really fascinated about what was the thinking process of the person that built this uh this application this framework how how did they manage to introduce this so some of the vulnerabilities that really got me interested in bug bounty hunting because at first it was really the these write-ups and um the bounty amounts that i was seeing because that's uh, that's what got me on this path it was i was seeing a bounty for ten thousand dollars a bounty for two thousand dollars 
So, for example, this one from Orange is extremely interesting. The way he got he got a remote code execution, and it was this was in the early days of bug bounty hunting. So companies weren't really paying that much attention. Another one is a uh, is a bug in Counter Strike 1.6, which is which is really cool. That the thing is, bug um, for a lot of people, bug bounty hunting only means web vulnerabilities. So that's uh, that's what I want to emphasize here. That some companies, especially gaming companies, will pay for vulnerabilities in their software, in their actual applications. Uh, going forward, there's this. Uh, there was a vulnerability in in Counter Strike Go, which um, uh, which led to a remote code execution. And this would be really bad because, you know, you can have the map and someone will join your server. Um, another one uh, in Valve, it was an SQL injection. And um, down on the right and kind of down, um, it was in uh, Rockstar Games. And he, uh, the hacker that found this was able to... Um, well, what was able to introduce any emblem in the uh, Grand Theft Auto V game. And with that, he was able to get local file inclusion and SRF. Um, this one from Uber, it's ultra interesting the way that this, um, this hacker was able to get account takeover. And uh, yeah, so I... This this is a part that got me really really interested in bug bounty hunting. So the motivation: why would somebody? Why would you want to do this? So or why do I want to? Would why do I want to hack companies that from whenever from whatever part of the internet? Well, the first part is if you're doing this full time, you can uh, actually work from anywhere because this company is these companies will pay you based on your skill, will pay you based on the vulnerabilities that you find and nothing, nothing else is important. It's important the impact that you can provide, that you can prove to this company. Um, you will develop a specific, really specific skill set because, um, well, bug bounty hunting is um, doing this all a lot will allow you to be always on the edge of technology because every older bug will be uh, every older bug every older older bug class will kind of be automated will people will start to find it in from the from an external perspective uh, will start to find it with automation but on the other side they will start to find it in their in their code with things like code ql now but there will always be a new way. There will always be, always be a new bug. So you'll, you'll essentially be on the edge of technology. You'll essentially find new ways to hack. You'll, and this this really keeps me motivated. It's really interesting. Um, the community is really tight, and uh, I have a slide specifically for that. But the people the people in this community are really really interesting they have a great sense of humor they're they're really really cool um well for me i always wanted to be a i always wanted to learn hacking and i always wanted to do this as a kind of a job um so training with real companies you're actually doing that because you're hacking whatever you want training for ctfs and the uh, nice part i think because the thing is, this doesn't, um, you're not required to have over 18. You're not required to have a certification. You're not required to even finish high school or college. It's not important. As, as long as you can find the resources to develop a better skill, a, a good skill to find vulnerabilities. And as long as you can find creative ways to find vulnerabilities, you don't need any of that. You only, the only thing that proves your ability is your skill and the and the bugs that you found find um so my kind of my recipe how how do i get started um there are more bug bounty platforms than these ones but these ones are the principal ones and these ones are the 
are public so you can just lo uh, register on hacker one and you can make your account and you'll be able to access a lot of companies that have a public bug bounty program um some other companies can do that so this should be the main one i recommend looking at each one of these because Companies um, work with different bug bounty programs. So you might find a company working with HackerOne, but another company working with bug crowd. So depending on which company you want to hack, you because you might be interested in hacking. Well, I want you might be saying I want just to hack this company. So you'll be finding that on one of these companies, one of these platforms. Um, my recommendation. So these bug bounty platforms have a way of incentivizing their community and building up their community so my recommendation is to stick with just one platform and um diversify the programs that you hack on but stick with just one company because they will have a lot of ways to incentivize you after you get uh, after you pass a certain threshold after you get better after they start to notice you they will have ways to incentivize you by sending private invites your way by well getting you getting you in closer in with some community some community part of there or just by no knowing more people on the platform that's in, incredibly important because knowing more people or uh, getting more private invites you this will start compounding so even if your first month you're not going to make anything even if your second month you're not going to make anything it will start to get better and better by the compounding effect my recommendation but because this is how i started this hacker one because they have some incentivize uh, they have some perks for newcomers um, is to go on HackerOne. So there are two types of programs. You have public programs. So for example, PayPal, Yahoo is public. Uh, Amazon is public. I think there are a lot of public programs, but there are a lot more private programs. Uh, well, Mm, there are ups, there are ups and downs. There are plus and minuses for each uh, type of uh, each type of program. Because if you go on a public program, you'll have a bigger scope. You have uh, a lot of times there are higher payouts on the public programs, and um, the bugs are more rare. And something I noticed is that a lot of people. There, are, there isn't that much competition on the public programs because uh, everyone is everyone is thinking that because it's public, they uh, all the bugs were found or something like that. But the developers on these public programs, because there are these huge programs, think Facebook. Facebook is, pu is pushing code every day. It's pushing a lot of code every day. So you will find a lot of things you'll find a lot of interesting stuff on the other side there are private programs uh, usually the payouts are not that satisfying but uh, the targets might be fresher uh, not that many people might have looked at at this private private programs my um my secret recipe for getting started for getting started on hacker one is to get started with a hacker one hacker one on ctf uh because this ctf is well it's really put together because they were they made this for real world vulnerabilities they made this for um for stuff that is usually found in real um, real programs so this is not like some ctf that somebody thought about about a really hard program problem that's a really corner case no on the hacker one 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 there are really real world challenges um so if you do the first two or three challenges you'll get one private invite if you do all the challenges you'll get 10 private invites if you accept all of them you will have those 10 private programs and you can start hacking in this um, 
in these private in these private com programs in these companies. Uh, what I did to get started, I hacked on each one of these private programs that I got at first. So this was almost three years ago. But I hacked on each one of these for one week. I spent all my time thinking of all these different scenarios that I can prove an impact to the clients of the company that I'm hacking. And uh, sometimes you get nothing. Sometimes you get really low vulnerabilities, but sometimes you get something. You get that that really interesting vulnerability. So get enough of those and you'll get more private invites and uh, it's a upward spiral that keeps pushing and pushing. Um, it's important to read the policy. Uh, I said that before, we'll get to that slide. For, and um, at first, I recommend following a hacking methodology because, well, mo mostly at first, I didn't know what I was doing. I was all over the place. So um, something more structured will help you find a few vulnerabilities at first to uh, get you the first few wins. And that will start, uh, that will start uh, getting you the motivation that you need. So the policy, well, it's important. It's important that you know that what you what you hack on. So you will look at the policy to see what are the rewards, which is kind of important. At first, it isn't, but it will get important after the first six, uh, ten months on on uh, hacking. And you will see what types of vulnerabilities, what type of vulnerabilities is this company interested in, what's the actual scope? Because you will find a lot. Of, for example, PayPal, you will find a lot of of sites that are owned by PayPal, but a lot of them, which will be marketing websites, they are um, they are putting them in a lower bracket of payment, so of bounty. So they wouldn't be that interesting to look at you really need to check the policy to make sure that your time is worth uh, spent. So your time is really spent well. Um, so for my hacking methodologies, what I recommend to do at first when getting started with this, I, uh, I do a lot of bash scripting. It's a lot, it's everywhere. I have a lot of uh, a lot of swords, a lot of cut, a lot of pipes, etc. Um, so stop domain discovery, screenshots, directory discovery, and after that, manual testing over the assets that you find. The first um, stop domain discovery and screenshot, you will allow you to find them. if you're hacking a wild card domain, a wild card scope. There are on these programs, you'll find some programs that only allow you to hack on www. Just to skip those programs, but don't tell them. <laughs> because if you have a wild, if you have a wildcard domain, it's easier for you to hack for a longer time. And hacking a, long, a longer time will allow you to find more and more about the company. If you start understanding the processes that the company, the processes inside the company, if you start understanding how their developers build code, you will be able to compound more and more. You will be able to find more vulnerabilities by just knowing how they think. So if you only have one domain on that private on that program, it's a lot harder to compound on this. So my suggestion is always go for the wildcard domains. Uh, doing this, you doing the screenshotting, you'll find everything you can about us, uh, the, the asset of the company. Um, for the subdomain, for subdomain discovery, there are two ways. I preferably go with the passive way, which means that you, I will use Amas uh, on the passive mode, find domain and soft finder, which are both passive. Um, but if the company is really small or if it's a new company, I would go for the um, brute forcing. So for the brute force, this is a really neat trick, but this tool, pure, pure DNS is incredibly good at brute forcing subdomains. Um, and for screenshotting, I use Aquaton. It's enough, I think. Uh, and uh, another thing here, if the asset is less than 
20 or 30 subdomains that, well, if I find less than 20 subdomains, I just open them all in the browser and look at each one of them. So directory discovery, this is, uh, this is just for finding if you, um, if the um, if the asset has some hidden some hidden files some hidden content i will be brute forcing for um, for the first assets and if the um, this depends if there are new apis with nodejs or stuff like that this will kind of not work but if you're on older and or older if you're on I don't think the older is the right way to put it, but if you're on the Nginx or Apache kind of uh, websites, you will uh, you'll be able to find some directories, and with these directories, they will kind of point you that you have another direct that that's a directory, and it will redirect you from not slash to slash, and it's an interesting way to go deeper and deeper in finding um, in finding some content. With this method, I found a few vulnerabilities to just files that were not supposed to be there. Uh, Google dorking will help. Uh, there are, well, kind of you just put site and the domain and you will see a lot about the site. And also if, they, you're, if they're using PHP or Java or something, you'll be looking out for these extensions. Um, I suggest looking at the web archives too. There are some tools for that. It's um, some is Getaldo RLS from, um, I think it's Corbin Leo on GitHub. It's a really good tool. Um, and from brute for uh, director brute forcing, um, FFUF is really, really good. I mean, it's the, I think it's the best tool. You can use Burp Intruder too for some on and off things and uh, Right now, it's Kite Rhino is kind of interesting, but I haven't had the chance to use it. So the fun part, the part that I was uh, that I'm really excited about is understanding the application. So you will be understanding this uh, the application only using Burp Suit. Here with Burp Suit, you'll be able to um, see all the traffic, be able to repeat some of the traffic, um, have the ability to understand what's happening. If they have web sockets, we'll be watching every interaction. It's, um, well, it's really important to understand this, um, understand the surf, understand the asset. Um, at first, if you're just uh, getting started, so if you don't have a license from for work from work or anything else, uh, if you're just getting started, I think a work community will suffice um and uh, after getting your first bounty i suggest using that money to buy bar pro after you get roughly 500 dollars um and i i think this this will be enough to get started the community um what really helped me and um, right now i'm reading a well i'm reading a book it's called atomic habits and the thing that say here, the, the author says in this book is that um, a lot of our habits are, are pushed, are, um, how to say this, to get a good habit and to be, to have a good habit, um, a productive habit, your environment is really important. So your family and your friends are extremely important for you to get that good habit. And there are kids that get the that get and will have the habits that they develop during their childhood with their parents. So on this theory and uh, realizing this now, being part of, of a hacking community, and you won't be able to get that in any country. I mean, physically, I don't think you'll be able to get this opportunity to be part of the community of a live community. Um, or at least it'll be a small community, but my suggestion is to get on Twitter, follow everybody, follow everybody that I'm following or start following by, start following me and start following everyone that's related to security. You learn a lot of, from these hackers. Many, I think every bug hunter is on Twitter and 
funny thing about people that are bug hunting they're really eager to flex about the bounties they about or, or the vulnerabilities that they found or the amount of money they made from these vulnerabilities so there will be a lot of useful information on twitter um you will jo you should join the hacker one on discord and you'll learn a lot from that and uh, there's um we have this uh, local cy cyber edu discord well it's kind of international but it's filled with uh, uh, romanians and um, you will learn a lot there about security um about collaboration i guess if you have if you find a friend that has this passion and will be able to ha hack at the same time as you or you'll be able to collaborate on uh, targets it will be a lot more fun. So, for example, a few days ago, I found a vulnerability that, well, I found a vulnerability somewhere around a month ago, and uh, I wasn't able to break it. I, I it was half vulnerability, and I wasn't able to get something from that vulnerability. So I um, sent a message to a few of my friends. Well, can you look at this? Can you can you find something? And no, no one was able to find anything in that part, but it felt like it was really, really vulnerable. And um, I rem remember that I had this vulnerability and the, it was still on my mind after a month. And I sent that message to one close friend. I sent, I said, I said to him, well, if you look at, look at this, we'll get a lot of money if, you, if you're able to hack this. And um, well, he looked at it in five minutes I spent the following two or three hours talking with him about that. And he was able to, I was looking for a small vulnerability. I was looking for a cross-site scripting vulnerability. He was able to get a remote code execution in that. I don't know how, but <laughs> hacking with friends is extremely, extremely important. You, I, I couldn't even think about getting that much impact just from a thing that was, I thought it was cross-site cross scripting vulnerability. Um, so everything related to bug bounty training is uh, free on the internet. You will, you can hack, you can learn to hack without paying from for any courses. I recommend, uh, well, I recommend the web section on on CyberEd. I recommend Hacker One on STF, which have a lot of real world vulnerabilities. If you're kind of getting started, but even if you're really good at it, Web Security Academy by Porsvigar have a lot of laboratories for each kind of vulnerability and they get deeper and deeper. They're really, really good. Um, a thing that I was doing at first, I was doing a lot of CTFs when I started. So I read about the, um, I read the write-ups of every CTF from, uh, I read the web challenges of every CTF on CTF time. They're really interesting. Read the hacker one activity because basically the, <laughs> here, there you will see the people flexing with a lot, with a lot of interesting vulnerabilities that they found. And um, you'll, you'll learn about the, so for example, looking uh, to the right, you'll see that you'll see a vulnerability on GitLab and you'll see that GitLab paid for a critical for that type of vulnerability. You'll start learning which companies value what vulnerabilities and which which vulnerabilities are more common, common in some, in some uh, companies. And if you want to get better at Bash, the over the wire challenges were really, really, really good when I did them. I did them over six years ago, but really interesting stuff to get started. Um, yeah. Final remarks, don't quit your job. There are um, financial aspects to this part, to this uh, bug bounty hunting. Um, the way that I did it, I, I had a job and I was uh, doing bug bounty hunting for, I think, one and a half year or something. And at some point, there's some point that where bug bounty hunting begins to be more and more interesting and you can see that you will have more and more opportunities to hack really interesting companies and to get more and more bounties that will surpass everything that you have at your job 
but that's not that first. That's not in your first month. That's not in the first six or 10 months. You might not give, even get a bug in the six months because even for me, I, I forgot to put the graphic here, but my graphic is that I have, this year I have two or three months that I only got $500 per month. And um, it can be depressing. It's, it can feel like, well, I can't find anything or I need to get a job. <laughs> but um, I, the thing is, this will really be really hard at first when you're not that skilled yet or when you don't have yet that confidence that you will always find something. So my recommendation is to wait for the moment that feels right in terms of financial, in terms of the bounty amounts that you make and in terms of how stable you feel with everything that uh, with the bug hunting versus your job. Or just don't quit your job ever if you find this really, uh, this is really fun for me, but you can do this on your off time. Um, yeah, that's about it. You can go to Q&A if anyone has anything to ask me. Thank you very much for your presentation, Robert. And I think it's awesome how you mentioned time and time again how much the community helped you. And you mentioned this at the hacking conference that gathers together one of the largest hacking communities in uh, in Eastern Europe, at least. Uh, so I really liked uh, hearing this over and over again. And I think so did our participants. I'm a bit curious, um, how, uh, how would you describe your ways of dealing with adversity? Like you mentioned, during the months when you barely manage to get any vulnerabilities, during the months when you maybe feel sluggish or tired, how do you stay motivated? Um, uh, well, um, my I have a spreadsheet that works in a certain way, especially, especially made for this. So right now, right now, my income spreadsheet, my revenue spreadsheet is, is for one year, but I have an average per month, month amount. So I never, never focus on the amount of money that I made this month or last month. I usually focus only on the amount of the average, on the average amount of money that I'm making per that uh, per that year. It can be depressing in, if I don't get anything in January and February, but this, this, um, this didn't happen yet. So I'm only focusing on that. So, and the other part is that my only goal is to be extremely proactive while, um, and to be extremely productive, the productive is not a right word to be extremely creative. I found out that um, I can't be creative in that if I can't cover the base needs. So if I can't cover the minimum amount that I need to pay my rent, pay, uh, get, get the money for food and everything. So if a month is below that, it was really depressing at first so when I first started, but after getting more and more bounties and after getting a, uh, it's kind of a snowball effect. You get more and more opportunities. Um, you stop feeling that. You just get used to finding. So even if you, there's a bad month, you will find another. You will find another way to find a bug. And it, it makes you creative these months because it forces you to find new stuff. That's great advice. Um, and I was wondering about one more thing. Uh, which is sort of the flip side of what I asked you about. So I'm absolutely sure that at times the adrenaline can be so much that you want to keep doing it and keep digging and keep trying things. And I'm going to guess that there have been times when you felt exhausted or maybe burnt out from um, spending so much time on maybe one company or one challenge. I was wondering whether you draw boundaries uh, around how much time you can spend doing this and how those work for you. Um, well, I have a bit of a tighter uh, of a tight schedule. So I'm uh, right now I'm only hacking uh, for two or three days at, at a time on a program, and uh, I, because that's how much I can stand hacking over a program. I'll get back to the program a week, or a week later, but I'll just need those pauses. And in that pause, I'll hack another program on or I'm doing anything else. But 
I kind of need those pauses for me and I can't hack for one week on one week long on a program. But on the other side, I can't hack two programs a day, for example, because I need to really, really focus on a program to get deeper and deeper on their surface. So I need to be hacking just that program for two or three days straight to understand everything about it. Yeah, makes sense. And it's great that you found something that really works for you and that you're sticking to it. Because as, as we've heard today, burnout can be a real nuisance. And especially during this time when it's hard or illegal to get out of the house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it can really bring us down. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm sure it inspired a lot of people to at least go into training <laughs> for finding bugs. Uh, you, on uh, bug bounty programs if not maybe it even inspired people to go back to it if they took a break and uh, I hope you can sleep with yourself at night that you're personally responsible for that <laughs> I'm really hoping I'm really hoping that one one year or two years after uh, this presentation someone will come up to me and say well I saw your presentation and I was really motivated by it because I did that to a lot of people that motivated me at first so at first I was like watching a lot of uh, slides and presentations and from people that did uh, similar presentations to mine on bug hunting and one or three years two years later when I kind of met them through the community I told them well I really enjoyed the stuff that you put out there it was really important for me on my journey you heard it here first folks go say hi to your heroes and thank them for inspiring you because it really matters and I hope you get yeah. to hear that from people Robert yeah I hope to thank you